Hello, this is Argonne at Lunch. My name is Justin Bro, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here at Argonne National Laboratory, which is one of 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories. Argonne, in particular, focuses on energy, environment, national security, and a whole lot of supercomputing is going on. But today, we're going to be talking about modeling. How do scientists create the models that go into the things that we know about. Today we're going to be talking with Doug Sesterson, who is a research meteorologist here at Argonne National Laboratory, as well as Rob Jacob, who is a computational computer scientist. Now let's go, and, and Doug is over here, so let's just start with Doug here. Good morning, Doug. How are we doing today? Good morning. Doing fine. Thank you. All right. So why don't you tell me the, the first, my first question for you is, what type of researcher are you? Okay, so um, in my mind, there are different kinds of research scientists. There's theoretical, and these are the people that you can really, that you can't do an experiment the beginning in the universe that you don't have data for. So it, it, most of the, the, the science is done there is through uh, logic and the physical laws of nature. Then there's what I call the observationist, and I put myself in that category, that, gee, we want to go learn something, and, and we can see it, and so we can take data. And then as we get the data, we can start to understand how it works. And there's a third type, and I call that the modeling or the data visualization type. In other words, Sometimes you can't put something in a lab and study it. You, 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 it's too big. So we come up with what we call analogs for, for things that are too, put, too big to put on a bench in a lab. So that's what we're talking about today. So you are clearly an observationalist, so you put yourself in that camp. But let me, tell me a little bit more about what a research meteorologist does, because I understand that's what you are. Okay, true. Um, well, I went to school, uh, college, and I thought I was going to be a physics major. And after about three years of that, I thought maybe I would like to do something a little bit more exciting. And we were moving our physics lab that summer. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, skies go blue-green, and, uh, and sirens go off, and we get hail the size of eggs, and, and windows are breaking, and people are screaming. And I'm sitting there going, what's this? And they said, well, that's, that's weather. It's meteorology. What do you got to do to learn all this? Study weather, study meteorology. And off to graduate school I went, and the rest is history. There you go. Inspiration by near annihilation by a major storm with hail the size of eggs. I understand that. So my next question for you is, what we're doing is we're modeling. So we're, as an observationist, you're going out and you're seeing things and you're trying to create a model of it. Talk to me a little bit about data quality and how that applies to the work that you do. Well, data quality, today I'm mostly involved in climate research, climate science. So one of the things that we're most concerned about when we take observations for a long period of time that as technology comes along, we get newer and better improved instruments. And so as we replace them with, with better units that give us more detail and so forth, we want to make sure that we don't disturb the long time series trend by arbitrarily adding something that has a bias to it. So we overlap those instruments for a period of time, maybe a year, sometimes longer, to make sure that we understand if we're going to take this one out and plug this one in, that we don't disrupt the longer term time series. One, one here, I know this is a softball one for you. So tell me what the difference between climate and weather is. Okay, the short answer is that climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Did you hear that? So what that really means is that we'll take a 30-year average of climate. That's, so if we put a weather station outside of Argonne and we measured every day the rainfall, we did that for 30 years and we'd average it and we would look over 30 years what would be the weekly average or the annual average or the daily average. When did it fall? And we get to build a nice distribution of data. That's our expectation over 30 years of what it would be like. It's an average. But the weather is actually what we get. We know that the average weather doesn't occur every day. It goes high and low. It goes, goes high and low. So when you're watching the 10 o'clock news and they say the normal for today is like 62 degrees and it's going to be 72, we're above average. So the climate, what we expect, year to year would be 62, but what we got today was 72. And it is a beautiful day in Chicago. If, if you're not here, sorry, <laughs> maybe next time. All right, so the, my next question is going to get to this cool demonstration that we've already promoted for you. So Doug is going to do a demonstration of how, a, how do we model a tornado. So why don't we walk over to our area over here. So tell me how, like, and you're going to be doing all explaining here, so you tell me how you model that. So actually, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple device. It was, I'm going to shout out to my daughter, Rachel Hopper. She did this as an eighth grade uh, science fair program and, uh, at Homer, Gen, uh, Homer Glen Junior High. And the idea is, um, was to build um, a tornado chamber and ask it some questions, create a tornado. So this is basically plexiglass. You can buy that at Home Depot. And, and it's got clothespins in on the side to keep the flow open. It's got a ceiling fan. Okay. Let's see if we can get Doug a little bit closer so we can get some, some close-up so, shots so the there. The idea is with, with, with the ceiling fan, when I turn it on right now, the air is being drawn out of the box, 
but it's being replaced by the air coming in through the box for the four sides that are open. So if you can imagine, the wind column is going like this. And so it gets into the middle, it says, what do I do? Well, the strongest force of whichever leg has got a higher wall that's open, a larger opening, will actually cause wind shear. It'll cause it to rotate, start to, to turn. And so we can simulate then, that's what we think tornadoes do, it's a rotating column of air, so what can we learn from that? And so right now we can see that there's a perfect tornado in there. But what's the problem? Can't see it. Can't see it, because why? Air is invisible. And so we put something in it, like, you know, pigs and tractor trailer trucks and grass and dirt. We have minute tractor trailer trucks just for our audience on Argonne. However, we're going to be safe, and we're going to do it a different way. So what we're going to do is we're going to produce a cloud. We're actually going to take some dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide, it's 200 degrees below zero, and we're going to, and it's, it, it's so cold that when I pull it out of the atmosphere, out of the box right now, um, it, you, you'll see this sort of a smoky, milky sort of smoke around it. It's right. actually Because dry ice doesn't melt. It, it doesn't melt. It actually sublimates. But, it's, but carbon dioxide is invisible as well. So what it's doing is the cold air from the dry ice is actually condensing the water in the air right. around the ice. So let's show that. But we're going to, first of all, put on our personal protective equipment. Always safety. And, and while, we're, while Doug yeah. is doing this, uh, I just want to bring you back to say that you are watching Argon at lunch. We're talking with Doug Sesterson, who was a research meteorologist at National Laboratory. We're talking about how scientists model difficult to observe things like tornadoes. So Doug has just introduced the model that he's built. Actually, his daughter Rachel built this model for an eighth grade project. And he's going to tell us a little bit how scientists figure out that what they're observing is actually true by building this type of model. Okay, so because it's invisible, we can't see it until we put something in there. I'd like to put a cloud in there. So right now I have a piece of dry ice, and you can see it has got this white, wispy, looks like smoke, but actually it's the cold air is coming off the dry ice, and it's actually chilling down the air around it so that it condenses the water vapor into little droplets. And so we've made a, a mini cloud, sort of how Mother Nature really does it, without dry ice, of course. So what we're going to do is we want to get more than that to, to see our tornado, so we're going to put it in boiling water, 212 degrees above zero, 200 below zero. It's going to be quite a cloud. So, so here we go. Wow. So it was there all along, but now we get to see it for the first time. So what's happening is, is that we can actually see what we call the vortex of the tornado. We can see it, and it kind of looks like a real tornado, but what can we learn from this? So the first question we might have, and by the way, we're not doing tornado research here at Argonne. This is really just an analog to show you how uh, scientists would actually use this type of a, of a physical simulation of a tornado to understand what happens in the real environment and be safe. So at this point, if I'm a tornado chaser, I would like to know, well, how close can I get? And the first thought I have as well, is the wind field just inside the part that I see, or does it extend all around it? What do you think? I think it extends all the way around it. Let's find out. So that's what researchers do. I don't know if I'm right or not. It's just... That's why we did the experiment. So what we can do right now is get another piece of dry ice and some, some uh, boiling water, and we can do streamline analysis. So what I'm going to do is just hold this to one of the sides, and all of a sudden you can see that the, wow, we're really filling the box. You can start to see that the air is rotating all the way to the edge of the box. Not the part we see, but the entire wind field. The structure all around the tornado actually shows that is that there's rotation. But if we had a slow speed or a high speed camera in there, we would see that the part that I'm injecting to the side of the box is actually going slower than the middle of the tornado. As a matter of fact, when Rachel did all the calculations, she found out that the wind speed of where I am right now at the edge of the box was four times less than the wind speed in the center. So that means if you're a tornado chaser, the part that you see might be 200 miles an hour, but if you come out, and we call this to scale, that if we take one tornado height from cloud base to ground and we come out from it, then we would say the wind speed would be about one fourth less. So if we're talking 200 miles in the center, that's right. you get about a mile out, you're talking 50 miles. Yeah, that's, that's how much the wind is. That's right. right. But the point is, it just doesn't go from zero to 200. Right. There's, there's always some wind present. So, so we've learned a little bit about this. So let's go see how this really scales to the real thing. So over here, we have no signal. <laughs> what happened to our video? Ah, there, there it is. we go just like magic. So this is actually a tornado it was in Rye, Colorado, 
And I want to call your attention to the point. Here come our storm chasers. They're looking at the column. This would be the center part that we just saw. But the really important part is that there's debris flying well outside of the visible cone. So it's important for, um, in this type of uh, situation, how close can I get to this without being in, in danger? Well, even 50 miles an hour with a piece of tin could be fatal, but it's certainly not the same as 200 miles an hour. So they don't want to chase right up to the edge. You really want to hang back, however high it is, tall-wise, stay that distance away, and you'd be about one-fourth of the wind speed. So um, there's a joke we have, and, and the joke is that there are old tornado chasers, yep. and there are bold tornado chasers, but there are no old, bold tornado chasers. And that's the comedy show that we have at Argonne to lunch today. <laughs> Ducks is talking. I love that. All right, so... Uh, if you're just joining us, this is Argonne at Lunch. I've been talking with Douglas Sturson. He's a research meteorologist here at Argonne National Laboratory. He just took us through a fabulous demonstration that has to do with tornadoes and how we know, how we, the models that we build accurately represent the phenomenon that is difficult to be able to see, like tornadoes. But that's just one part of the equations. Our next conversation is going to be with Rob Jacobs, so I want you to follow me over this way. Rob Jacobs is a computational climate scientist with Argonne, and here he is right now. Hey, Rob, how you doing? Good, how are you? All right. So why don't you let me know, give me a, an idea of what types of projects you work on when here at Argonne. So uh, here at Argonne, I work on uh, uh, climate models. And what climate models are, are they're really large computer programs that we write in order to solve the complex equations that describe the climate system and how it works. And what type of uh, hardware are you using to process all this data? I imagine it's a ton of data. Yeah, it is. We have to use uh, some of the world's most powerful supercomputers to run these models. And one of the ones we use is uh, Mira right here at Argonne, which is one of, the mo one of the most powerful computers in the world. Excellent, excellent. So I see you have an image here. Uh, it's, a, it's a satellite image for actually from 1960. What are we looking at right here? So um, uh, as Doug showed, the, uh, the atmosphere undergoes all kinds of scales of motion. We have everything from tornadoes to what is called the general circulation, which is a big global circulation. And that's the thing that we have to get right in our climate models. And one of the only ways we have to look at that is through satellites. And this is showing how much the technology has advanced over the years. This is a picture of the first ever image from, one of the, from the very first TV weather satellite. And what it's showing, it's very grainy, it's black and white, it's just one image. And we're looking at clouds. Uh, that's what the white stuff is. And we can kind of see through a clear area here. This is the uh, coast of North America. This is uh, the Canadian Maritime Provinces, Hudson Bay, and the east coast of the U.S. is down here. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How technology has changed. Actually, it looks like the picture from one of my first cell phone cameras. <laughs> so time has changed. So right. we're going, so what type of technology? So we're only looking at the visual spectrum here. We right. can't look beyond the clouds, really. We can't see a lot of detail. Right. And we have no motion also, which is what's really important in understanding how the atmosphere works. Okay, so let's talk about evolution. So this is going to be the next one. Now this looks pretty awesome. Why don't you tell us a little bit what, about what we're seeing here? So taking a big leap forward, this is the latest uh, weather satellite that the U.S. has launched. It's called GO-16. Uh, it just started sending pictures this year. It's not yet approved for operation, so this is kind of an uh, early peak. Okay. And what this is showing is many, many things. First of all, we have a view of the whole Earth, um, and we have a view of, um, of, uh, of uh, again, clouds, and um, we have uh, many images that we can put together and form a movie, basically, of what's going on. This is, uh, an, there's a picture every 15 minutes, and um, they get... Um, uh, stitched together and shown in an animation loop. And from that, we can get an idea of how the atmosphere is moving. And this particular uh, sequence is from the recent hurricanes we had uh, in early September. That's Hurricane Irma that we just saw crashing into Florida there. Uh, that's Jose. And uh, Katina was over here earlier by the coast of Mexico. Oh, wow. So I'm seeing a lot of information that we didn't see in the previous one. Number one, I'm seeing we have temperature. Now we can find out yep. how hot or cold these masses are. That's right. This isn't just where the clouds are, but it gives us a, a sense of how tall they are in the atmosphere. So the taller they are in the atmosphere, the colder they get. And that's what this temperature scale is showing. So these are really uh, high, uh, cold cloud tops. And then down in the bottom, uh, closer to the surface, we have warmer clouds down here. So this gives us something about the 3D structure of the atmosphere. That's amazing. If you're just joining us, this is Argon at Lunch. My name is Justin Bro. Right now I'm talking with Job, uh, uh, Rob Jacob, who is a 
uh, computational climate scientist here at Argonne. We spoke to Douglas Sturson earlier. He built an amazing model where we were, we were basically talking about how scientists can build models to help understand difficult to observe phenomena. And we we're just talking with Rob about how we just come from an image from the 1960s and we have a satellite which just put in the air this year. And this is just another way for us to understand the difficult to get at phenomena. That's right. The right. atmosphere is, of course, invisible. It's an invisible gas. So we need something in the atmosphere to reflect light and show us how it's moving. Uh, Doug was using water vapor, and we're also using water vapor here, only the real water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, another interesting part of this image that's very important to climate is you can see a little bit of what, we, what I call the general circulation. Up here where we are in the uh, mid-latitudes, uh, the, the air is generally moving from west to east. But down here in the tropics, the, the air is moving from uh, the opposite direction, from east to west. That's a feature of the general circulation that we need to get right in our models. Is that also why toilets in Australia flow backwards? Um, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Partly. <laughs> All right, so this is, this is amazing, but now we have more uh, of, a, uh, of a model that is based more on theory, and I think that's the next image that we're going to see. That's right. Now we have all this information from our... What I want to do is bring uh, Doug back in here. We have uh, a few questions that were asked uh, before. So can I let you guys decide on who's going to answer it? So um, where do you obtain your data? Um, I can talk more about uh, Rob where he gets his data, actually, because today the climate system will take data wherever we can get it because we need to understand uh, how everything is moving from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the atmosphere. So we need not just satellite data, but we need uh, shipboard temperature observations, uh, observations from uh, 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 drop signs that go through the atmosphere, things they throw overboard into the ocean to measure the depth of the ocean. We have weather balloons on a daily basis. The weather surface doesn't watch as uh, weather balloons. Question. We need data from the crew. What do you mean by model? So we've been talking about model, but if you want to give me another example, when people say model, you think about model training. Simulate something. So, if you want to go a little bit further and explain the model, I think we give you two examples of model. So, this is a physical model. Um, in this particular case, um, tornadoes just don't stand still and you can't put it in a laboratory and study. So, if I have to make something downsized, small enough, that replicates what it does, so we put it on a bench and study it. So, you can have a physical model of the representation of the physical model. 
mathematical model. So uh, mathematical physical model. Behind those equations have to be set to our motion. Uh, written down to describe the motion of a fluid creation goes from the atmosphere to the atmosphere. Uh, equations for coupling of that motion. So all of those equations are then converted into algorithms. The algorithms are converted into computer code, and then we run that code on the computer to solve the equations and get these kind of uh, So, ironically, it's if we go to where the model is saying data can be read. And the whole idea is that even though we have a model, we use the data to get a model to understand the process that Rob is talking about, but we also use the observation to validate the model that we use as a whole. Next question. What is carbon-13? What's that got to do with climate? I got that one. So, boy, that's a good question. You did your homework. So, basically, there's several isotopes of, of uh, carbon. Carbon-14 is what we've been dating with, carbon dating with. Carbon-13 is the most abundant. Carbon-12 is actually unique to plants. Now, we, when we talk about global warming, we can talk about greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels that's adding to the greenhouse gases that trap the heat in the atmosphere, which is causing global warming and climate change. So um, what's really important is, is how do we know it's us? How do we know it, it's not some other natural phenomenon? Well, carbon-12 is unique to plants. When the plants die and become a beauty mess called oil and we burn it, guess what? It's carbon dioxide, but the carbon is carbon above. Same thing when we burn coal. So we, so but the atmosphere mostly has carbon-13. So we can look at the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 over a long period of time, and we find that that actually tracks the global temperature. Thank you, whoever asked that question. I said that's a beautiful. One. I didn't know, and now we know. Okay. Uh, other than the public, are there industries that rely on weather data? Uh, uh, I mean, many, many industries are weather dependent. Agriculture, uh, of course, is a big one. Uh, uh, a lot of tourism, payment industries depend on uh, having good weather. So it's uh, a hugely important part of the economy. Uh, last question, what type of software do you use to model climate? We, we talked a little bit about that, but uh, basically we use supercomputers, but if you want to go a little bit further. So yeah, uh, all the software is custom built. So uh, there are no like off-the-shelf commercial packages that we can use to model uh, the climate system. Uh, there's a lot of commercial packages that do fluid dynamics uh, that you can purchase and some of them free. But that's mostly for fluid flow and like a small pipe or some other kind of way. So they're not for modeling the fluid of the atmosphere. So these are all custom written uh, in computer languages like four characters. And you write these yourself? I mean, there's a. Okay. <laughs> I got three at a desk. <laughs> all right, I want to thank you for joining Argon at lunch. I've been joined by Doug Sturson, he's a research meteorologist here at Argon, and Rob Dick, who is a computational climate scientist. I'm Justin Bro. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much.